This episode of Startup is brought to you by Pipedrive. Pipedrive is an easy-to-use sales management tool designed with small teams in mind. With Pipedrive, you can view your prospects and any upcoming deadlines all in one place. Pipedrive's drag-and-drop interface also allows you to keep track of your deal's progress every step of the way, so nothing slips through the cracks. Check out pipedrive.com slash startup to learn more. Hey there, it's Lisa Chow. Startup's on a break this week, but there's a new Gimlet show that I want to tell you about. It just launched. It's called Every Little Thing. The show is hosted by Flora Lichtman, who's a science journalist, and every episode is about finding the extraordinary in the everyday. We're going to play a recent episode for you now. This one is all about office plants. It turns out there's a lot I didn't know about office plants. So here it is. I hope you like it, and if you do, go subscribe to Every Little Thing. I guess I was addicted from day one. There's never, ever been an instance where I'm like, should I swing by in the alley? It's, yeah, what time, how fast can I get out of work and swing by in the alley? I get approached like I'm a dealer or something, you know? I People come up to me and actually have whispered, are you the guy I need to talk to? It's like, why are you whispering? It's fine. I'm Flora Lichtman, and this is Every Little Thing from Gimlet Media. And the person you just heard from is Blake Valkyr and his alleyway addiction. Get ready. It's office plants. And that's what today's show is all about, the lives of office plants. I'm here with producer Christine Driscoll. Hey, Christine. Hey, Flora. How did you come across Blake in the first place? I met him last summer in Chicago. He's my friend's neighbor. Uh, He and my friend were talking across the fence in their backyards, and he was trying to give her these plants that he had. And I looked in his backyard, and he's surrounded by all these potted plants. And then I realized they're all office plants. How do you know that they're office plants specifically? Well, they weren't plants that you would pick out to be like, oh, I'm going to look at this hibiscus on my patio all summer and enjoy the beautiful flowers. It was things like bromeliads, which are those spiky kind of single stalk plants and vines and a lot of wilting palm trees. All leaves? All leaves. Yeah, all leaves. And so naturally, I wondered what is going on here? Why do you have so many of these office plants in your yard? And it turns out this started for him a couple of years ago. He was on his way home from work and he took a different route. He turned down an alley. And there were these gorgeous six, eight-foot tropical plants sitting in the alley next to a dumpster. So, um, I don't know, I pulled up, kind of looked around, didn't really understand why they were out there. They looked really nice, but I figured, hey, if they were by the dumpster, they were they were free. And so he took those three tropical plants home, which, by the way, those are, they were huge trees that you might see in a lobby to try and save them. And then he went back the next day to see if there were more plants, and there were, and the next day, and the next day. So someone was throwing out plants every day. A lot of times they'll throw 10 to 20 in the dumpster, and I'll fish them out. And he kept going back until it became a daily habit to go pick up plants and rehab them. He ended up with so many office plants that he couldn't keep them all, and he had to start giving them away. I think about, in the almost two years I've been doing this, and I I literally, it has to number close to a thousand plants I've saved. It's awesome giving people plants that have never had plants before. Do people ever call you Planta Claus? Yes, the plant provider, the plant man, Planta Claus, ugh, whatever. (laughs) When I first heard this story, I had so many questions. Why are they all office plants? What makes an office plant an office plant? And who is throwing them all away? And the answer to that last question led us to a whole industry right under our noses. Not a lot of people know about, like, what we do. Or, like, people know that it gets done because they see it every day. That's Matt Schechter, and he's an interior scaper. So interior scapers are like landscapers for indoor spaces. They provide plants, they curate plants. Matt's family's business is called Interior Foliage Design, and Christine and I went to visit them in Queens, New York. Oh, welcome. Wow. It's like a tropical oasis. The plants are in this tennis court-sized warehouse with kind of a translucent ceiling. It's like a greenhouse ceiling. They're big fans. 
and it is filled with plants. So when people call, they're like, oh, we want some greenery or we want some plant life or we want to put, bring life into this space. A lot of dead spaces out there because a lot of people are like, oh, we need to make working here happier. So I'm like, all right, cool. Interior scapers like Matt rent out plants for events or they'll supply plants to office buildings, hospitals, malls, banks, places like that. And this company in Queens is just the tip of the interior scaping industry iceberg. The biggest interior scaping company in the country is called Ambius, and they work with chains like Red Robin and Nordstrom. They're like the Starbucks of office plants. They're everywhere you go. Part of what interior scapers do is pretty straightforward. They evaluate the interior environment, light levels, available space, and choose which plants will physically work. But here's the other thing they do. They match make plants to the personality of the company. So yeah, so we have uh, plants like these yucca canes, which are not necessarily more masculine, but they're uh, spikier and uh, more <laughs> not. They're not aggressive themselves, but it comes. It can come off that way. Are these like power trees? Yeah, totally. You would see these in bachelor pads all the time. Um, not. I am not joking. Seriously? Yeah, they're the. They're like the, what is it, the hide rug of the plant world, you know. <laughs> oh my God. Do office spaces or companies say, okay, we are trying to project an image totally. of power, Absolutely. give us your most powerful looking plant? Not, they won't say it like that, but I'll know what they're saying. Well, or, what's the sub, how do they say it in their language? Well, they're saying they, we want it to reflect, we want it to reflect the, what we're going for as a company. Are there plants that, um, that are like, Wall Street plants or banker plants? Well, there's definitely uh, old school like law firm plants. Uh, yeah, let's I'll show you that one. Yeah, here we go. So, so this is a Kentia palm. It looks like sort of the um, fronds of a palm tree, but totally. all stuck into the ground. Right. Basically, there's no this the there's no trunk really. It's right. like a lot it's of stalks. Multiple, it's multiple stalks coming from the root ball. It can be seen as a little bit more of a conservative plant. Now, why does anyone care about a Kentia palm? Well, they're originally from Lord Howe Island off the coast of Australia, uh, which used to be a British colony. These plants were taken from that side of the world back to England, and only the aristocracy would be able to afford them. And that's why you'll notice that if you go to like the Plaza Hotel or like any other old money kind of world, you'll see them because they were the original status symbol. Like now you can just like buy something online or you can buy a Mercedes or something, but back in the day, there were, there were different ways of showing status. This is so cool. So this is a status symbol plant from... It's a, well, it's a status symbol plant, but most people who walk into an office today will be like, oh, cool plant. Uh oh, what's yeah. happening? I don't know, let's find out. Hey, Walter. These are taken out of account? Yeah. Okay. Why are they coming back? Um, they want to replace for something else. Because they don't like the way they looked, or do you know no, why? No, because um, they're a little too dangerous to the place where they was. We're looking at a, a large cactus. <laughs> yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah so All we're right. going to replace it with something less dangerous, yeah. You know how it goes. Sometimes it doesn't work out between office and plant. Sometimes they just don't click. The reason this interior scaping company is willing to take back this cactus is because their client didn't just buy the plant, they also bought a guarantee that the interior scaper will replace the plant if it's dying, or it looks bad, or it has too many prickles. It's like a free refill for plants. These companies don't want to be resuscitating plants on premises. This is Matt's dad, Stuart Schechter. He's the founder of this business. They have a conference room. They're talking about big deals. They want to make sure the plant looks good. And I don't want the guy calling us here to say, hey, I've got a dead plant on my reception desk. <laughs> Can we just spend a moment imagining plants being super key to big business deals? I just really like that idea. Yes, I think it's very accurate. <laughs> I, if I'm in a room thinking about spending money and there's a big healthy plant 
giving me a sense of abundance and calm, I am going to confidently sign that contract. Matt says they do all they can to keep their plants healthy. In fact, the interior scaper sends a technician to water and care for the plants. But nonetheless, there are occupational hazards. We can't control all factors, like for instance, people putting coffee in the planters or people putting other sorts of liquids. And this like, is making me enraged. Yeah, I know, I know. But sometimes people are like, oh, it's nutrients. You know, I'm like, no, it's not. But like, it's a, it's a client. And I'm not going to be like, mm, actually, you're not really supposed to do that. And they're like, all right, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Go wipe down some plants, you know. <laughs> This maintenance agreement and the free plant refills, it all helps explain Christine's story about Blake, the guy scoring plants in the alley that we heard from in the beginning. Yeah, so the plants he was taking were from an interior scaping company, which was throwing out all of these very mildly damaged plants because the offices they were in can't make big business deals if there's a single dead leaf on their kentia palm. (laughs) So Blake is like this scavenger on the outskirts of this big industry, taking the things that they throw away and making good use of them. That's how lucky office plants retire. But what about office plants in their youth? What about their salad days? Where do these plants come from? They come from Florida most of the time. (laughs) Yeah, all the time. All the time, right? All the plants here, yes. So when this happened, I was like, surely this is only true of this business. Whatever Matt says, it can't be true that all plants in New York are coming from Florida. Right. It's not like there's actually an office plant capital of the country. Of course not. That would be outrageous. That would be outrageous. Okay, so on our left, just um, potted plants as far as the eye can see. After the break, we follow the office plant trail to the source. Plus, we find out why you see the same kinds of plants over and over again in offices. And guess what? It has to do with astronauts. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace's award-winning templates allow you to instantly create a beautiful website or online store to turn your hobby into a real business. Because until you have a website, it's just a hobby. Do you have a hobby? You want this is Christine Driscoll. She's a producer at Gimlet's newest show, Every Little Thing. I just started taking like a circus rope class. What is a circus rope class? Basically, you climb up a rope hanging from the ceiling. You tie a knot with your feet and you do tricks on it. You're using your feet to tie a knot. Yeah, so that you don't fall. So when can you start making money doing circus rope? Um, I feel like I have to know more than three tricks. So probably when I know 10 tricks, I can make money. And when she learns those tricks, she can document them on a Squarespace site. Creating a Squarespace site is a super quick way to turn your hobby into a real business. Right now, use the offer code STARTUP at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com offer code STARTUP to get 10% off. Make your next move with Squarespace. This episode of Startup is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron delivers all the ingredients you need to make home-cooked meals straight to your house, getting good food on the table fast so you can spend more time hanging out as a family. Because for me, at least, getting food into the house is the hardest part. Like, here's my colleague Rachel asking me about it. And I was wondering if we could just talk about grocery shopping. Oh, God. (laughs) The bane of my existence. Because it's like, I'm doing all this preparation for the week of like, okay, these are the meals. This is what we need. It's very time consuming. Okay, but so if you don't go grocery shopping, what, how, do you guys eat out a lot? Eating out with kids is such a pain. Just chaos and disaster that I don't want to eat out. It's much easier to eat at home. They don't eat. That's the number one thing. My one-year-old, who's going to be turning two very soon, he doesn't sit still. So restaurants require eating and sitting still or sitting in a chair. And they don't do either of those things. So we never go to restaurants anymore. Drop the grocery store hassle and quit worrying about who will or won't sit in a chair. 
You can get started cooking a variety of easy, affordable meals made fresh in your own home today with Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu with dishes like Parmesan-crusted chicken with creamy fettuccine and roasted broccoli. And get your first three meals for free with free shipping. Go to blueapron.com slash startup. Okay, so on our left, just um, potted plants as far as the eye can see. Acres. It looks like farmland, but just with filled with potted plants. Ton of palm trees. A and M Nursery, Live Oak Farms. Three Sisters Farm. Ooh, they have a farm stand and a tiki hut. I love Florida. Yes, we're in Florida, specifically Homestead, Florida. It's it's really the mecca of um, foliage. Um, for the for the nation, really. That's neat. I think most people don't know that. <laughs> yeah. That's Bob Chin. He's one of the owners of Capri Farms. They grow indoor plants. And Homestead really is the epicenter of this. The USDA does agricultural censuses, and the data show that Florida is number one for growing interior foliage, and Miami-Dade County, where Homestead is, is number one within Florida. Yeah, it's location, location, location. Bob said that Homestead is the office plant capital for a couple reasons. It's on an interstate, it has access to fresh water, and it's really far south, close to the tropical climate, where a lot of these typical office plants come from. Like any tourist, plants love this weather. This is Vanessa Campaverde. She's an extension agent for the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences Extension Service. And what that means is she does job training and education for plant growers. And in her official bio, she does make note that her last name means greenfield in Spanish. I'm from the beautiful country of Peru, uh, an export product to (laughs) South Florida. I'm a... Alumna from the University of Florida, go Gators. You brought us breakfast, which is really above and <laughs> way above and beyond. We should be bringing you breakfast. No, I think I just like you to feel welcome. I mean, I think that's part of my Latin culture. We like to feed you until you explode. <laughs> Vanessa talked a lot about how hard it is to grow office plants. I mean, think about the utility of a foliage plant. It's all about how the plant looks from top to bottom. Ornamental plants have to be perfect, uh, super pretty, and have no injuries on it for you to want it to buy the price they're selling for. You know, I've never thought about how hard that has to be to get a plant looking perfect. Like, they're participants of a beauty page or something like that because they have to be perfect and pretty all the time. In general, vegetables, for example, you don't care about how maybe the leaf of that tomato plant looks like. Mm-hmm. In fact, you don't ever get to see it. But the final product of, of an ornamental plant is the entire plant. What are some of the, the threats to ornamentals here? What are, what are people, growers worried about? Oh, boy. Uh, for example, we have uh, a lot of invasive pests down here. We have a giant African land snail pest, like giant, like 10 inches could grow. 10 inches? Yeah, I have, I have a ruler I can show you. And then they can eat up to 500 plants. Ornamental one plant. snail? One snail. And if they don't find plants, they will eat a, a native snails. So yeah, I mean, that was like a horror movie for, for ornamental growers. The threat of snail attacks and other pests can help explain what makes an office plant an office plant. First and foremost, office plants have to be hardy. Right. The plant has to cope with being moved across many state lines to a low-light environment and potentially have coffee (laughs) tossed into it while still looking so fantastic that it is inspiring, calming, and power-exuding presence in the conference room. But there's also this interesting historical reason why we see some of the same kinds of office plants over and over and over again. Christine, you looked into the history? I did look into the history. So we have to go back in time to the 1970s, where people are working in office buildings with new synthetic building materials. There's also carpeting and ink and other machinery, which are all off-gassing. Off-gassing, so like giving off chemicals? Yes, yes. And sometimes they even mix together. And then there's the energy crisis. 
buildings consume a lot of energy, and so one response to conserve energy is reducing ventilation. And so there's suddenly less air coming into the building. And with all of this stagnant air and chemicals, and sometimes smoke, because it's the 70s and people can do that, <laughs> um, people start to basically feel like they're allergic to their work environment. And there's even a name for it. People call it sick building syndrome. That's amazing. There is actually a sick office syndrome. Like, yeah. that's a real syndrome. Sick building syndrome. Sick it was building. a real problem. And it starts to get a lot of attention in the 1970s and 80s. Is the air in your office making you sick? What about sick buildings? Can they make you sick? It's on sick building syndrome. EPA workers say recent renovation in their building is literally making them sick. Newly laid carpet may be the culprit. Some workers are calling this carpet gate. But EPA officials say they're doing their... So people are concerned about indoor air pollution at this time. And office plants are proposed as part of the solution. And here's how it happened. In the 1980s, NASA was also looking into some of the issues that happen when you keep people in a sealed space. For other reasons. Exactly. And they wanted to know how they could effectively clean the air in that space. And so NASA and the Associated Landscape Contractors of America do a study together. They look into how effective plants were in removing toxins from the air. And they publish a list. And I'm going to give it to you. So this is a list of plants that are really good for cleaning up the chemicals that all of the stuff in offices are giving off. Right. Is and that I'll, right? That's right. Yeah. I'm going to look at this list. And I'm going to... Oh, my God. It's every office plant. It's every plant. The spider plant. The bamboo palm. The weeping fig. The variegated snake plant. Most typical office plants seem to be on this list. This is what makes an office plant an office plant, that it can clean up, like, the toxic waste zone that is our office. It's a big part of it. That's really cool. So that helps explain how the standard set of office plants came to be. But when we were talking to Bob Chin, the grower in Homestead, Florida, he was thinking about the future of office plants. And that means... Nurturing new talent. This is a Giganta, and it's, um, it's a signature plant for us right now. We always try and um, develop new plants for the industry, and this happened to be one of them that's really thriving. It's a very large leaf, um, variegation, bright against dark green. This plant never falls into the background. It's a wow-type plant. So this is a signature. Does that mean that you found it? Um, you develop it, possibly, market it identify it as being a good interior plant. The, the name originally was um, um, Dracaena, not cane, which was... Um, like I, N-O-T? N-O-T, not cane. It's definitely a sexier name than not cane. I, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah, you have to make them love it, else it doesn't have a chance, really. All right, so I'm, I was looking at Giganta, trying to figure out where it might end up. It's kind of an imposing plant, long, elegant leaves. Um, they're dark around the edges and then have this lighter stripe down the center of the leaf. And to me, it has a kind of regal look, like it would be a match for a Ritz-Carlton lobby, or I feel like it could also cut it in a corner office. And the person sitting next to it might never know the journey that this plant is on, from Homestead, Florida, to the interior scaper, matchmaker, and then after doing its job in the lobby, maybe if it's lucky, it'll end up in the hands of a local Planta Claus. Or maybe it ends up in your office. And if it does, you can thank Bob. What about the people whose office they're in? Do you think about them? Um, I, I have to. You know, they're, they're the beneficiary of um, all of this work. So, you know, you hope they appreciate it. That's it. I hope we left you more excited about office plants. And if you want to keep appreciating the world around you a little bit more, I have good news. Every Little Thing already has other episodes up that you can go listen to now. Their latest one is about parliamentary procedure. Uh, when you think about the Constitution, that's a point Madison makes, which is uh, if you agree on the process, you feel still upset that you lost, but not, uh, not that you've been cheated. Right? And when people get cheated, bad things happen, often violent things. To listen, search Every Little Thing wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.
Thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is used by a wide range of businesses, musicians, designers, artists, restaurants, and more. Everyone can benefit from Squarespace's beautiful, award-winning templates and easy-to-use all-in-one platform. Right now, use the offer code STARTUP at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com offer code STARTUP to get 10% off. Create your page today and make your next move with Squarespace. Thanks to our sponsor, Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone so you can spend less time hunting down good ingredients and more time enjoying them with your family. Get three free meals with free shipping at blueapron.com startup.